Well, I have a, uh, I have a question that I want to ask you that I often ask myself. I often ask myself, God, what do you want from my life? God, what do you, what do you want from my life? And you think, well, Zach, you're a pastor. <laughs> shouldn't you know what God wants from your life? I mean, shouldn't you know? You of all people, you're the pastor of the church. Well, I think that God wants me to be a pastor, yes. But that's just one thing out of so many that God wants from my life. You see, I, I received a calling into ministry when I was pretty young. And then that calling was confirmed in middle school and in high school. And so then I went to college. And I, I was going to go to college to be a pastor. And while I was at college, I then felt like God was pushing me to go to churches in small rural communities. Places that maybe they have felt forgotten. And I said, well, well, God, that's fine. If that's what you want, then that's what will happen. But, you know, if I want to be a rich pastor, that's not going to happen in a rural community. And everyone desires to be a rich pastor when they go into ministry. And that's just a joke. <laughs> um, so I felt like, okay, well, maybe I am called to smaller communities and to rural churches and to rural people. Because the way of life is just, it's so different in a city. And, you know, if God, if that's what you're calling me for, then equip me and I will go. And after college, I then did some seminary work, some graduate work in Kansas City. Definitely not a rural setting. And then while we were there, my wife gets a job offer in Fargo. And so then we go to Fargo. Definitely not a rural setting. And I said, well, God, if you want me in ministry, then put me into ministry. And what I did was I worked in a normal job. I worked a regular job and so did my wife and we bought a house and started a family and this whole time I felt like, God, I, I have this call into, into ministry. I went to school for it. I have trained for it. You have per, put this passion on my life and I felt like the Old Testament prophet where he says that I have a fire in my bones and if I don't speak it, then, then I'll explode. You know, I, I got this fire shut up inside me and so God, well, you know, what do you want? And what do you want from my life? And so then I, I started looking for a job into full-time ministry. I wanted to be back in full-time ministry, Lord, because I don't want these distractions in my life. And I'm a distractible person. I get distracted really easy. You see, there are times where I'm working in my office where I have to go work at home because when I'm in my office, I'll be working on something which makes me think of something else, which makes me think of something else. And then instead of doing what I'm supposed to, I'll be looking at something that it's going to take months and months of planning. But for some reason, that's what's important right now. And I get distracted. And then it's Saturday night and the outline sermon that I have isn't a full sermon yet. <laughs> God, what do you want from my life? And, and so I looked for a job in full-time ministry, which required us to sell our home in Fargo. And we moved into my wife's parents' basement. We did the very millennial thing of moving back in with the parents. I said, God, what do you want? Show me where you want me to go. And I wasn't looking for a position in rural ministry. I wasn't looking for a small town. I wasn't looking for a small church. I was looking for a job in ministry. And I get a call from District Superintendent Roger Spar from a denomination that's not the denomination that I was in. And he said, I have a church for you to look at. And then before I know it, here I am in Westington Springs and in Alpena serving rural churches in rural communities. A calling that I felt on my life in college, confirming the calling I had in my, of my life when I was a kid to be in ministry. And here I am. So when I ask the question, God, what do you want from my life? I understand that it's not one thing. and I understand that I won't know right away that God leads us through that journey. Well, while I was in college, I did a number of things. I interned at churches. Of course, I was going to school. I, uh, I met a wonderful woman that eventually turned into my wife. But one summer while I was in college, I was on this traveling team. And, uh, and we went to different youth camps and churches, and we played as a praise band, and we led them in worship services. And at the same time, we kind of promoted the college that we were at. And uh, college was in Oklahoma, so as summer started, we left Oklahoma, we traveled up, we went through Idaho over to Oregon, and we spent a few weeks in Oregon going to different churches and some different youth camps. And then we traveled down through California and spent some time in California, 
Then we went across the Great Desert and all of those states that are there that it's just a desert, so whatever that section of the U.S. is. Uh, <laughs> Daryl, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> You're there half the year. And, and so we went through the desert and we got back to Oklahoma. But while we were doing that, we had this big van, we had a trailer that we pulled. After too many hours in the van, we would stop and we would pull off to stretch our legs and check the, uh, check the trailer and the equipment inside to make sure things hadn't shifted or fallen. And we would just stretch our legs. A wonderful place to do that is California because they have all of these pull-off spots where you can pull off and then there's usually some stairs that you can go up and you'll get a nice vantage point, usually to see the Pacific Ocean or to see a mountainside or see something like that. And so all down California, we're like, okay, it's been too long. We've been driving for six hours. Let's take a break. And so we would climb those stairs. We would stretch out. We would look at the vantage point there at that scenic overlook. And we would see the Pacific Ocean. And we would just stand there and look at almost this unfathomable expanse of water and think about how great God was and God is. And it's so beautiful. But then after a couple of minutes, we would say, all right, we'd get back in the van and we'd continue down the road. None of those scenic overlooks were really worth taking a group photo at or posting it to Facebook or spending hours and hours in contemplation and meditation. It was just a place to stretch out, take a break, and have a couple of seconds. Now most any long road trips, or, or perhaps even if you go on a long hike through a national park, you will have some sort of stunning view that is a good place to take photos at or to sit at for a little bit. But more than likely, if you're on a long road trip or you're on a multi-day hike, you're not doing it just to take five minutes at a scenic overlook. You're on the trip for a reason. You're on the journey for a reason. You have a destination in mind, and yes, the scenic overlook is part of it, but it's something more than that. If all you wanted out of life was that scenic overlook and that great ocean view or that great mountainside view, what you could do is you take a couple hour trip to Sioux Falls, you hop on a plane and you fly out to California, you either rent a car or you catch a cab or you get an Uber, and they'll take you right to the beach. 150 feet later, your feet are in the ocean. If all you wanted out of life was that, that one scenic overlook, it takes minimal effort to get that nice view. I think that some of us sometimes treat our faith like a scenic overlook. You know, we, we pray a prayer to Jesus, we, we commit our life to him, and we think, I've got my ticket to heaven. And while on some level this is true, yes, the work is done, I'm going to go to heaven. If that was where we stopped, then we would miss out on the true joy and fullness that Christ has, Christ has intended for every moment of our lives. You see, the journey of faith is a spectacular one. It's filled with joy even in the midst of sorrow and pain. It's full of happiness and celebration, even though you know that things aren't quite right in the world. And if our faith is just this little exchange of, I said a prayer, and now I know I'm going to heaven, then we miss out on so much more that God has intended for our lives. I mean, you see, when God created humanity, if you look in your Bibles and you start at the very beginning, we find out that God created everything, the heavens and the earth, the sea and the expanse, everything within it. He created Adam and Eve, and he created them to have a relationship with him. We find out in Genesis 3 that God walks in the cool of the garden, and Adam and Eve were meant to walk with him. But sin happened. And sin fractured that relationship. And it caused Adam and Eve to feel shame for what they had done. And so they turned away from God and they hid from God in the garden. They were created to be with God. We were created to be with God, but we are separated by sin. But the story doesn't end at Genesis 3. We keep reading in our scriptures, and then when we get to the New Testament, we find out that Jesus came to repair that broken relationship. 
that original thing that was meant, that creation, to be with God in relationship, it has been restored through what Christ has done for all of us. He came so that we could experience once again what it is like to walk with God. And we find out what God wants our lives to be like. You see, last week, the point of the message that I brought was, are you focused on what you want God to do for you? Or are we focused on what God wants to do through us? Are we focused on what God wants to do for us or through us? Because when we allow God to do something through us, he will do something so much bigger and so much more extraordinary than we could ever ask for God to do for us. And I remind you of this because I hope that you have been praying for God to do something through you and for God to do something through this church. I was reminded that we informed everyone on August 18th that I had been appointed to and accepted the position of two churches in Gerald County. Two years ago on August 18th, we told the world, this is where we're going. This is what God wants out of our lives at the moment. And since then, I have been praying, God, what do you want to do through us as a church? What do you want to do through us as these two churches in Gerald County? God, what do you want to do through Gerald County to all across rural South Dakota and into the other states? And so what do we need to be doing right now so that God can be doing something through us? Not for us, but through us. I remind you of last week's message because I think we should be praying over and over again, God, what do you want to do through us? What do you want from my life? What do you want to do through me? Again, Jesus came so we could experience again what it is to walk with God. And what Jesus wants from our lives. You see, there was a person in our scriptures that they had that question as well. It's in Luke chapter 10. And so if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. Or you can just listen. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? The expert of the law answered. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. All your heart. All your, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Worship is defined as expressing reverence to a divine being. In this passage, we hear that an expression of reverence, we hear that to love God is to do that with all that we are. Our heart, mind, soul, and strength. God isn't calling us to have a faith that is a scenic overlook faith. Where we pull off the road every once in a while and we stop and say, wow, isn't God great? I feel a little refreshed. Now I'll hop back in my car and keep going on my own way. God calls us to something so much greater than that. God calls us to live a life dedicated to and invested in his love giving all that we are to glorify God. Now, the interesting thing about this passage is the question that the expert of the law asked was this, what must I do to inherit eternal life? All right, how, how do I make sure that when I come to the end of this road trip of life that I am on, that I end up at that scenic overlook, that I end up at the gates of heaven and not at the city dump? How do I make sure I end up in the right place? Jesus doesn't answer, do this and you will go to heaven. Did you catch what Jesus says? The man asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And at the end, Jesus says, do this and you will live. The man wanted something for himself. He wanted the assurance that, yes, I will go to heaven. 
But Jesus wants to do something through him right then and right there. The more that I read this, the more that I come to understand that eternal life does not start when we die. Eternal life starts when we start living for Jesus. Do this and you will live. Eternal life. Eternal life in Christ starts as soon as you give your life to him. So what does God want from your life? Again, I think it takes a lifetime to figure that out. Because it isn't just one thing. It isn't one scenic overlook on the road trip of life where you say, yep, that's what God wanted. When we begin to live our eternal lives out right now, every single day, living out radical love with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, you will begin to experience joy in every part of your journey. We aren't supposed to be pulling off at the scenic overlooks and give glory to God for a couple of minutes. Yes, we will have the scenic overlooks of life where we glorify God, but the truth is when our life is in Christ, every moment of every day, we will find fullness and completeness that we never could have anticipated. When you start living out your faith every day with radical love, you will find God is with you. He's not just at the scenic overlooks. He's with you. You will have moments where you struggle, but you will find a firm foundation of love beneath you. Knowing that because you have given your life to Christ, you have a fully restored relationship with God. Once again, you are walking with God. Once again, God is with us as it was originally intended at creation. And so when we experience blessings and excitement along the journey of faith that we are on, we can share them with our Creator, knowing that God rejoices with us. And then when our way becomes dark and we feel like we can't even see the road beneath us, we will be drawn to the light of He that goes before us. When we know our destination, because the point of the journey is to reach a destination, When we know our destination, it makes the journey so much more important. When we give our lives to Christ, we have an eternal home with him in heaven. But we don't wait until we get to heaven to start living our eternal lives. We live it out on earth as it is in heaven. So have you committed your life to Christ? And are you living out that life now? Because life in Christ is life eternal. And eternal life starts when you say yes to Jesus. Are you living out that eternal life now? With all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Are you living out that eternal life now? Loving others as much as God loves you. God wants to do amazing things through us through each of you, through your families, and through this church. Let him. Let him by living out that eternal life now. And when you do that, you will find life abundant. Start living your eternal life now. Don't wait. And you will be amazed what God will do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, That we have the opportunity to live eternal life right now. Father, that we don't have to wait until the end of our days to start glorifying you. But we can glorify you with all that we are, with every moment of our day. And we can glorify you right now. Father, we are thankful that you sent Christ for us. And that he has restored that broken relationship. That when we come to him, our sins are washed clean and we can walk with you once again. Help us to put our trust in you. Help us to live a life that is worthy of your love. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.